Good evening. Welcome to this event in the week of Contemplation by Design. My name is Dr. Tia Rich. For those who I haven't already had the pleasure of spending time with during the prior days of the 2018 summit, I'm happy to meet you this evening. As you know, we collaborate with various departments on campus in order to bring you insight and wisdom about the role of contemplative practices in helping us to live lives of meaning and purpose and ethical uh, grounding. We are very honored tonight to be able to spend time with Professor Ron Tyler, a professor in the Stanford Law School. He is also the director of the Criminal Defense Clinic here at Stanford. And he will be sharing insights from his own contemplative practice that has endured several decades of really being on the front lines of criminal justice. We'd like to welcome him warmly to the podium as he's going to share his insights. And I'd like to thank him with a small gesture of gratitude so that he can pause and have a gentle cup of tea with the peace acronym of PAUSE. Thank you, Ron thank Tyler. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I think a great place to start is just to settle in for a moment. And so I'm going to get a chair of my own. And I will um, join you in just a moment. Um, and so I just want you to take a minute, and allow yourself to get comfortable. Let me change our lighting. Let's do that. And um, we're just going to settle in for just a short time. So what I want you to do is allow yourself to get into a nice, comfortable, seated posture. Just let the cares of the day slip away. And just relax into the chair. Start to notice the connections between your body and the chair, between your feet and the floor. We're just going to settle in uh, for just a brief period. I'll signify the beginning and the end of the period with a light tap on the bell just going to allow yourself to relax. Allow your shoulders to relax. Allow your head to relax easily on top of your spinal column. Allow your face to relax. Allow your cheeks to relax. And it's fine to just Allow your eyes to close and pay light attention to your breath. Here we go.
and we'll come back into the room. Oh, that was so brief, but I feel better. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, gratitude to Karen Buchanan for her support uh, in the presentation and for that moment when we were scrambling to make sure that the slides were working. So um, I think it'll work for us to keep this lighting as is. So the session that we're going to have this, uh, this evening is going to be a session, this is our little moment for quiet meditation that we just had. And what we're going to do now is we're, we're going to move forward and what we're going to do is have a session that is, as Tia said, part of Stanford's Contemplation by Design Summit. The summit is a series of events that are designed to bring the entire Stanford community together in a in these sessions that afford us the opportunity for experiencing the quieting of the mind, that afford us this opportunity to, to refresh ourselves through quiet contemplation. So the summit embraces and encourages a variety of different contemplative practices. Uh, when we think about the contemplative practices, there's really a, just such a broad array. I want to mention a few of them. Those practices might include things like stillness practices, quieting the mind, sitting in silence, meditation like we just did a brief bit of. For some people, it might be centering prayer. Contemplative practices might include ritual practices like establishing a sacred personal space in your home or attending retreats or participating in cultural or spiritual ceremonies. It might include Breathing and breath-based practices like walking meditation or yoga or qigong or tai chi. It might include practices that generate well-being like journaling or one of my favorites, loving kindness meditation. It might also include practices that enhance our relationships among each other like community contemplative pauses like intentional dialogue between one another, like storytelling. So just to get a sense of these various contemplative practices that I've mentioned, are there any among us who engage in any of those practices? Just a show of hands. Yeah, see what a self-selecting group. Uh, that's great. So um, I, I want to let you know that contemplative practices are, of course, as many of you recognize already, beneficial for so many different reasons. During this particular summit, we think of the practices as beneficial because they support the five states of peace. And when we say peace, we mean, first of all, the state of pause. We mean the state of exhale. We mean the state of attending, which we'll talk about in a moment, the state of connecting, and finally, the state of expressing. Uh, to be more specific about these, when we say that we're supporting the state of pause, we mean we want to be able to pause the active, ruminating mind. When we talk about exhale, we want to be able to just exhale in order to relax the body, right? We want to attend mindfully in order to reawaken the sensory awareness and presence. We want to connect with nature and with oneself and with others. And we want to express ourselves wholeheartedly and authentically. So these are the five states of peace that we think of as part of the Contemplation by Design series. Those five states of peace actually are meant to support and deepen and sustain the five traits of peace. These traits of peace, prosociality, equanimity, altruism, compassion, and ethics, 
right? Pro-sociality, the, the idea that we want to behave in a way that will benefit others or society as a whole. Equanimity of being calm and even-tempered, especially during difficult times. Altruism to act to promote oneself, uh, one's own, I'm sorry, altruism to act in a way that promotes someone else's welfare, even if it's at the cost to ourselves. And compassion, recognizing that we have a concern for the suffering of others and we act on that concern. We act on that concern because we have a willingness to relieve the suffering. And then finally, ethics, that we observe certain moral principles that will guide our behavior. So these traits of peace, by the way, I would say are often highly present uh, among those who are in helping professions. I think about um, emergency medical technicians. I think about paramedics. I think about some doctors. I think about um, uh, therapists. I think about some lawyers, even. <laughs> uh, some lawyers are like, what do you mean a helping profession? Yes, we are in a helping profession. Uh, so as we move forward through this evening, really this, this whole core peace framework is what we're going to be relying on, these states of peace and the traits of peace. Um, now, uh, I show you this jarring image here because really the evening session is going to explore for us together, let me just set that down, it's going to explore how these peace states and these peace traits will provide vital support to those of us who are working in and some are in some way enmeshed in the criminal justice system. When I think about the criminal justice system, I guess I want to give you um, uh, a working definition. Um, and this working definition for me, I don't know if you can see that on the slide, but it's a system of laws and processes that are purportedly designed to fairly assess criminal responsibility or lack thereof. Uh, and to determine an appropriate resolution. But what we know is that the justice system is actually fraught with unpeaceful states that bring about unpeaceful traits in everyone who's involved in the system. That's what we know. And so um, I guess I, I need to tell you that uh, for me, um, to spend a little bit of time talking about why I would find myself in this position right now, my own work has been a personal calling to service within that uh, so-called criminal justice system. Uh, for 22 years, I was a public defender. For the last six years, I've been the director of the criminal defense clinic. So for almost 30 years, I have been at war with the government, at war with what people call the carceral state. Now, if I'm going to be in that kind of war, if I'm in that kind of battle, uh, and if I'm protecting marginalized communities and doing that, I think it's fair to ask, have I become battle-hardened? Right? I think it's fair to ask, have I, uh, if it's a war, have I developed such hatred for my enemies that it creates problems for me? I think it's fair to ask, if it's a battle, have I become battle-weary? Do I have combat fatigue? Uh, do I have compassion fatigue? Am I burned out? Um, and if not, why not? <laughs> um, and so uh, the answer to the if not, why not is really, um, again, the reason that why I'm standing here. The why not is because of um, the role that contemplative practices have played in my own life. Um, and so just to spend a little bit of time on that before I engage all of you in some um, questions about how contemplative practices might work within the arena of criminal justice. Let me tell you about some of my own work. Um, first of all, um, my work in the, in the personal arena, I would say, um, has been some things that might be obvious. First of all, when I think about why I've been able to maintain the kind of um, vigor and um, excitement and compassion about the work. It is certainly about um, being sure that I take care of myself. Uh, 
exercise, eating right, all of that sort of thing. Uh, those are self-care, that's a notion about self-care. But I think also in the personal arena, of course it means some of the contemplative practices that we already talked about. For me, that means yoga. For me, that means meditation. For me, that means one of my favorites, which is really focusing on gratitude as such a powerful source of support for contemplative practices. So that's the, the personal arena. But I also want to share with you that for me, contemplative practices matter in the, in the partnership arena as well. Um, and when I think about the partnership arena, I think about that in terms of support for reflection and growth through authentic connection, authentic connection with my life partner, authentic connection with close friends, authentic connection with trusted mentors, including therapists, right? Sometimes law students are so surprised, they're like, wow, wait, really? You can talk about therapy? That's okay. It's like, it's more than okay. I wish that everyone, I, I wish that that was like a birthright, that you would have the right to a trusted mentor, including somebody who was trained to be a trusted mentor without personal um, involvement or attachment to our issues. Um, so when I think about the support that I have for contemplative practices, I think about not only in the personal realm, not only in the paired realm, but also in the community realm. I think about a community of like-minded individuals, right? Just like being with all of you. I think about that community in terms of things as simple as going together to yoga classes. I think about a community in terms as simple as going and sitting together with others in meditation. I think about community in terms of connections that I've been able to make with the people that I fight for, the clients that I serve, and their families. It's actually been a remarkable source of support overflowing gratitude that has come to me through my clients uh, and their families. So the personal realm, the paired realm, the community realm, but also I would say one thing that has definitely helped me, and especially over the course of the last decade or so, it's been in the leadership realm. That is, it's been in the ways in which I have chosen to become a leader in teaching mindfulness to others. Um, and when I think about how I've done that, certainly I have done it in my clinic. Uh, the criminal defense clinic has at its core a six to eight week self-care uh, workshop that is integrated throughout the clinic. And that self-care workshop actually relies upon what we were talking about earlier, these, these um, states of peace. Um, we certainly have opportunities for pausing it's always a wonderful, delightful experience as students come into my clinic and begin to realize that they're going to have the moment on a regular basis to actually take a break and just sit in stillness. So we have those opportunities for pause. We have opportunities uh, for, we, we have the opportunities for um, equanimity and in a criminal defense clinic, there are so many, we talk about difficult times and stressful situations, and so to have the opportunity to seek to model for my students how to be uh, calm and peaceful during those stressful times and how to return to it when we're not right, is, is a key part of my leadership role in teaching contemplative practices in the law school environment. We have opportunities in my clinic to attend to uh, being present. We talk about mindfulness triggers. We talk about ways in which we can bring ourselves back to this moment right here, to this moment, to recognizing, yes, there's a man up there who's filming. To, yes, there's someone rubbing the screen of his phone, right? So these moments right now, how do we keep ourselves right here? You know, which is a beautiful thing, the gift of even what I just did and what that does to me, to keep myself in this moment. In our clinic, we also, of course, talk about and look for opportunities for connection. Uh, connection is at the core of what we do. When we talk about a client-centered practice, what we're talking about is how are we in service to the people who, are, who actually matter. And that's why when I talk about lawyers as being part of a helping profession, Right, that's what you really, and then it's no longer about are we in some lofty profession because we went to some lofty school. It's about how are we actually in service and that's about connection. And then finally, of course, we also, in our clinic, 
seek uh, opportunities for authentic, genuine expression. Last Monday, we were together in a self-care session. And in that self-care session, we had the beautiful opportunity to um, watch the TED Talk, a famous TED Talk by Dr. Brene Brown about the power of vulnerability. Probably some of you have seen that TED Talk. And it's such a moving talk. And then it's not just about, in our clinic, it's never just about uh, me talking, the students listening, or us all watching something. It's like then you're invited. You're invited to participate. And so to have in each of these self-care sessions, many of the most powerful moments are those moments where students share together, first in pairs, first reflecting individually, then in pairs, and then in the larger group. And to have that opportunity in a larger group to decide, am I going to be willing enough? Am I going to be willing to be vulnerable, vulnerable enough to share? It's in, the, in other aspects of the clinic, um, Students are actually graded on participation, but not for the self-care sessions, because then it's really about what are, what are you willing to bring on any given day. Uh, and so those are some really important ways that I have strived to bring mindfulness here into the law school. But not only in the clinic, I also seek to do so with the 1L class. There's now something that some of you may know of, of the second orientation. So second orientation is an opportunity a few weeks into the 1L curriculum for students to come back together and to have the opportunity to learn and to discuss other aspects of what it means to be in law school rather than simply an orientation about there's torts and there's contracts and there's con law and so on. It's like that's all true and it all matters, but also what matters is what I talk about in second orientation is what is law school doing to you and what can you do about it? What is the design of, unfortunately, the academy uh, what is that doing to you individually and collectively? And how can you respond in a way, first of all, how can we as your faculty acknowledge it? And secondly, how can we all together respond in a way that, take care, that takes care of you? And so that's another way that I've sought to be a leader in mindfulness um, in the, the law school community. I also sought to do that by teaching around the country, um, which can be a big lift. Because when, you, when I go out into various um, communities and I'm talking with public defenders, um, I can tell you public defenders are, uh, I mean, when you talk about battle hardened, I mean, I know what that's like. And so there's a lot of cynicism um, and um, there's a lot of doubt. And so to uh, reach through that, which really helps, of course, by being, by being able to say, I'm, I'm one of your own um, and I'm here to help. Uh, so these are ways in which I've sought to serve um, as a leader in the mindfulness community around the, uh, around the country as well. Um, so I just wanted to share some of that, but really what I've been excited to do beyond that is actually to give you an opportunity. Um, and that's what this slide is about. This is you, imagine that's you. You're seated, you're calm, you're peaceful. And from that place, from that peaceful place, I want you to be able to think about we all, unfortunately, one way or another, end up with some connection with the criminal, the, I often will tell my students this sort of in quotes, the so-called criminal justice system. We often find ourselves connected in one way or another. And so I want to get, engage you in a more direct way. Uh, so I'm going to give you some scenarios. Um, and I'm going to see what I can do about dividing us up in a way that will give us the opportunity to uh, consider these. And once, you, once we present the scenario, what I'm going to want you to do is think about, given these states of peace and given these traits of peace, what can I do with, with these scenarios? You know, What are the traits that I would want to bring to the scenario that would actually help support compassion in the criminal justice system? And what are the states? that would support me in those traits, right? Um, and, you know, I'll remind you about the states and the traits, and, you know, I'll even come back to these slides as necessary. It's not a pop quiz. And, um, you know, I'll show you the traits of peace, uh, so we'll come back to that, and I'll show you the states of peace, we'll come back to that. But let me, uh, let me do this. In fact, before I, before I show you the first scenario, Maybe I'll I actually, again, with Karen's help, I made some copies of these. So here you go. 
traits are, are on one side and states are on another and we'll divide it up and um, Karen will take some and I'll take some. So here you go. So this, this way when, we're, when you're pondering the scenarios that I'm giving you, you'll, you'll have that. Um, Can you pass it down that way? Okay. Let's see. Welcome. Okay, let's see. Uh, looks like the one, two, three, okay. Uh, okay, I think is that how are we doing? Okay, okay. All right, okay. Now, that was the easy part. Um, okay, so here we go. Now, I think what we'll do is, um, so we'll have um, to figure out how to, how to divide this up. Um, well, for, all right, I'll show you the scenario, then we'll come, we'll figure out how to divide it. So this first scenario, what a harsh title, huh? Visiting time at the zoo, that's what this is called. And as the slide says, um, imagine, imagine that you are a guard at a jail, and it's your job, it, it's your job and you're walking from the parking lot to the jail. It's a Friday, it's the, one of those days that your friends call visiting time at the zoo. You hate that phrase, you don't use that phrase. You've never told them that you hate it. But even more than the phrase, you hate walking past the families that are there for visits. The little kids and the wives and the girlfriends all waiting for hours just for that one 20 minute visit with their loved ones. And they stare at you when they, you walk by. And sometimes the little kids cry and sometimes you hear like a barely muttered curse hurled in your direction. You hate visiting day. Um, all right, so now I have to like select some people. So you guys over here, you are, you are, the, you are the jail guards, okay? And so what I want you're going to be, you're, what you're going to be thinking about is, what am I going to do, right? I'm going to go back to this, right? What you're thinking about is, what traits might you bring to that situation that would bring compassion to the criminal justice system? Uh, you can all be thinking about it, but they're going to be giving us some answers, I guess. What traits might you bring, and what states would you want to be in that would support you in that? And so, okay, so while they're thinking about that, now we're going to pivot over to, to you folks right here, right? And, and here's, your, here's your scenario, and it's going to actually sound a little similar, except instead of being visiting time at the zoo, what is it? It's, sorry, these are the traits. Uh, oh, that's it. Nope. Coming to the lion's den, this is yours. You're the girlfriend of a man in jail. It's still visiting day, but you've come in order to keep him whole, to give him hope, to hold on to your relationship. You hate coming to the jail. You hate watching the guards that walk by at ship change. Some of them are mean, some of them are stiff, some of them are guilty acting. A few people waiting in line like you mutter audibly barely audible curses. You don't do that, but you do feel the pain and the anger that rises inside you. You hate visiting day. And so just like the guards have to think about how do they bring compassion to the criminal justice system? And how do they bring compassion based on the way they're feeling? So too must you as a visitor to the jail think about how, how are you going to bring compassion how do you rise above the hate and the anger that you feel, the hate and anger that you see around you among others? What are the traits you bring? What are the states that support that? 
We'll give you both groups a little bit of time to think. And, and those of you who will be like potentially the lifeline, the call, the phone a friend, you should think about it too. Right? And we'll just give you a minute to think about it. And then we'll return. If I had a little peaceful music, I would play it now. <laughs> go back to the guards. Okay, so you're pondering the scenario. Let's go to, um, here we are. Oops, I want to get you your definition. All right, so we'll start with you, those who are, who've been asked to be the jail guards. I'm asking you, given the traits that we talk about, pro-sociality, behaving in a way that benefits others, equanimity, being calm and even-tempered, even in difficult situations, altruism, acting to promote the welfare of others, even at the cost of ourselves, and compassion, right? concern for the suffering of others and a willingness to actually address that, plus ethics, observing moral principles. If we think about those traits, and if we think about the, the states of peace, the pause and the exhale, these other states that might support the traits, what traits might you bring to the situation that we've just described? Uh, and, and to help you, so you don't have to speak too loudly, we have a mic for you. Um, so I'll start, I'll hand you the mic. So this okay. is specifically in regards to the states of, uh, traits of peace? Yes. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I thought of was equanimity, uh, because as, you know, as a guard walking by the families, you have to take a deep breath, um, pause, and reframe the situation. You have to kind of take yourself out in terms of not taking what you may feel as the negative energy personally. Um, that's just me as a start. Okay, thank you. And thank you for being the first one, actually. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who else? Hi. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm, I work with Ron, but Professor Tyler. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, speak up a little bit. Though. So, um, Rather than frame it in those exact words, I want to describe something that happened today at the jail with a jail guard that I spoke with. I observed him. A, a woman was uh, coming to see her son and did not speak any English. Her language is Spanish. And so the uh, guard could have just sent her off because her son wasn't there yet. He had not been processed, so he could not be visited and she could not uh, sign up there for a visit. But what he did was he called over a young lady who was um, cleaning the floors, who spoke Spanish, and asked her to translate and helped that woman and gave her an information sheet and told her um, how, in a kind voice, and I thought from his like big exterior with the vest and all the badges, and he just stepped right out of that space and met her where she needed to be met and was helpful. And I know that was helpful to him because he visibly relaxed while he was doing it. And I don't know, I guess this is uh, compassion, right? He showed compassion. Just took him the same amount of time it would have taken him to gruffly send her off. But instead, he helped. So I actually complimented him after he did that. Thank you. Thank you. And the other thing I would note about that is the impact that it sounds like it had on you. Because maybe as you saw this uh, gentleman that you've described as being gruff and he's big and you know, I'm sure he was in uniform and all that, you may have had a certain notion about how you thought he was going to behave in the circumstance. And then he, he changed that notion. So thank you. 
Any, anyone else among the guards before we go to the other side? I immediately thought of Pull those, the mic up a little. I immediately bit. thought of those kids who were in line and um, were really impatient. I don't, I've never been in that situation where I've seen guards, um, never been in line on visiting day. But it seems to me that anything, if I were a guard, anything I could do to acknowledge the kids, to give them water, to um, just help them pass the time because it's just interminable when you're little. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the idea of acknowledging the children as you walk past. Um, it's actually remarkable that you say that because when we were talking about these scenarios before we arrived, my colleague Suzanne Luban and I, um, this is one of the things we talked about is, what if the guards actually simply stopped for a moment and actually knelt down and talked to the children? What if one day they brought toys for the kids? Is that against the rules? Are they going to be fired for doing that? I doubt it. Uh, and yet people um, get so stuck in whatever the straitjacket expectation is that they can't do that. So I think that's, that's beautiful. And I do. I mean, as I'm saying this, I think I wish that there were people among us who actually had that as a job, because to have the gift of a supportive community would mean that somebody could walk out of here and tomorrow do just what you said. Um, and it would, change, it would change them, and it would change um, and it would change the people that they, that they touched. So I'm really moved by that. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna go, uh, well before we go to, the, to, the, um, to those people who are, who are acting in the role of the women, what about, you guys aren't off the hook, what, what about the rest of you? Do you think of other traits that you would bring if you were the guard in this situation? Thank you, Karen. For Again, thank you to Karen Buchanan for her support. Personally, if I was a guard, um, I think my number one would be ethics. No matter how frust like frustrated I am, I need to make sure that whatever I'm doing or reacting to is in line with my morals. And even if my job requires me to step outside my morals, I shouldn't. Because that would then interfere with me being at peace with myself. So I need to be at peace with myself, and to do that, I need to have really strong ethics as a guard, because I have too much power. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, one, one thing that occurred to me is that this is a very tense situation for, for everybody, but people are saying things to the guard. Somebody could do something threatening. It's natural to tense up physically, to feel defended, because you're not sure what's going to happen. So I think attending to one's physical being, to one's posture, breathing, to be aware that it's so easy to defend and, and to lock up and tense up, and that when you do that, it sends a signal that you don't want to send. Thank you. All right, I'm mindful of our time, so we better switch. We better switch to the other scenario. So um, going back to that, it's not visiting time at the zoo. It is instead um, you're coming into the lion's den. What do you do then as the girlfriend of the man in jail? How do you manage all of the feelings that you would have about the people who you might feel are responsible for mistreatment or you might worry are going to be responsible for not protecting this person who you love and care about. What do you do about the potential uh, community around you as you're coming in who are potentially actually, instead of lifting up compassion, or potentially, uh, you know, as Michelle Obama would say, when they go low, we go high. Maybe, unfortunately, you're going low as well. So what, what are the traits that you bring? Start it off. Whoops. Is this on? Yes, yes. now it is. To borrow from the keynote speaker, Joan Halifax's wise metaphor of a strong back and a soft front, to keep my heart open but keep my back strong, using the exhale to allow the physiology to do that. And then the phrase you put in both scenarios, that both people hate visiting day, to connect with the common humanity, that there's pain felt 
in everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else who was uh, in the role of the, of the visitor. Please, I would want to have compassion. I was late, sorry. Um, I, just looking at the traits here, I, I assume you'd want to have compassion because you, you have concern for suffering of your loved one. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, if you can't, uh, might be hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do the traits that you suggested, maybe you would find somewhere in you that compassion to try to help your loved ones suffering at the time that you okay. see them. Thank you. I was thinking about both parties are probably here. Uh, you can wait for the mic, Karen. Thank you. I was thinking that both parties are probably feeling unsafe um, in different ways. The guards are trying to make sure there's physical safety, and the the women are probably concerned about physical safety, but also emotional safety. What are the people they're visiting going to say? How are their kids going to react to being in the jail or seeing everything? Keep so, the mic up. So how to attend to your own fear while you're trying to um, use these other traits of peace is is, I guess, a self-compassion also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go to, let's, because of our time, let's, I want to go to another scenario, actually. And this one, I actually, I'm going to open it up. Um, I have to be flexible. So uh, that was it. Okay, this is a, oops, I went too far. All right. It's raining defendants. You're a judge, you're assigned to this low level criminal court. Every day you see scores of people coming in and coming out, right? They're mostly poor. They're mostly what people call minorities, even though we're in a majority minority state. <clears throat> Some are dirty and homeless. Some are probably even high in court, right? Some keep coming back over and over again, always with some kind of new case, some kind of new excuse. You try to be careful. You try to be considerate. But sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're mean. Sometimes you're condescending. Sometimes you're ill-tempered. There's so many people, there's so much disarray. You just are trying to get through your calendar. You're just trying to get through the day. How do you as a judge bring compassion to that situation? What are the traits that you would try to, the peace traits that you would try to cultivate in order to bring compassion to the situation? What are the peace states that would support you in trying to cultivate those traits? I know, now you don't get quite as much time to reflect. Here you go. Remember to hold the mic up like this. OK, this is very short. Just have gratitude to have a job. So. <laughs> So I, I like the gratitude. You're saying if the judge remembers to have gratitude for, I guess I don't need that. If the judge remembers to have gratitude to have the job, then that might help to reduce some of the frustration. OK. Other, other answers about how a judge might bring, I mean, this is a live issue, right? I mean, every one of these scenarios is a live issue. Um, uh, you know, and I've spent time in mindfulness training with judges. And they care about, uh, about trying to address these issues. So, uh, what, what else do you think a judge could do in order to address this? Yeah, here comes the microphone. Hold it, hold it like this, just like you. Okay. Uh, the one I was thinking of under traits is pro-sociality, um, because I, I think sometimes when I'm relating to someone, I'm thinking in terms of what I think they need, but sometimes that's very different from what they actually need. And I think the more I can try to consider deeply what the other person is genuinely needing, I can be most helpful. And less condescending, too, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, let me, let me flip it, right? Because I flipped the other one, I'm going to flip this one, too, right? So what's the flip? The flip is um, cops and judges just want to leave me alone, 
right? Now you're one of those people coming into that courtroom. Another ticket for driving without a license. The cops keep pulling me over when they know damn well I don't have a license, right? If you have to drive, I don't have the money to get a license, but I still have to drive. This is California, how are you gonna get by without a car? God damn it. Now I have to spend all morning in this crowded courtroom, I'm just waiting, waiting and watching that woman in the robe treating people like what the card says. You know, I know my time is coming and I know she's not gonna be nice to me especially once she sees that I'm a repeat offender. Oh, dangerous, driving without a license, repeat offender. Oh, look out. But I have to get through the morning. So how do I bring compassion to that so-called criminal justice system? How do I bring compassion? You can imagine, this is, this is my issue. I mean, this is Ron Tyler's issue. How do I bring compassion? Help a brother out. A hand? Any hand? What are the traits? It's not a trait. Hold, hold on. I'm terrified That's okay, but as long as you hold it like this. <laughs> well, the trait is not on here, um, but I think taking responsibility for your actions, taking a moment, stepping back, pause, exhale, do everything that's on here, and take full responsibility. I'm in charge of my actions. So that, that should help, I think. So to I mean, be I'm, to I'm an educator, I'm an elementary school teacher, and that's what I teach. Every morning I start the day with meditation, and I tell them all, we are in charge of our actions, you have a choice. We can have a good day or a bad day. That's, to me, that's a very similar scenario. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. That's pausing. Anyone, here we, over here, I see. Um, for the states, I think that expressing is really important in this situation. So to really calmly take a moment to explain the predicament to the judge and sort of create context for why the person keeps coming back in, um, just so that there's sort of more humanity to it and that she can understand the struggle um, involved in the logistics involved in this issue and then also I think it's helpful in situations like this to express your understanding of what the other person needs so saying like I understand why the law requires me to have a license you know like expressing that you can kind of meet the person halfway and you see their perspective but also describing your own issues um, I think that's really important but it has to be done sort of calmly um, and with acknowledgement of what the other person how the other person might respond. So I appreciate that because I can tell you that in the Palo Alto courthouse um, within the last, so sometime I think a year ago, I can, I can remember a specific conversation with the judge who clearly had had the benefit of that kind of expression. Who said, I see the fact that it's not gonna do any good to simply impose another sentence on this person. Because if I do that, that's just gonna be more money on top of the money that they already owe that they can't pay. And so we have to figure out if there's another solution. And I think that by having a genuine and authentic conversation, we talked about that connection, right? The state of connection. We talk about expressing ourselves genuinely, authentically. I think that, makes, that can make a big difference. Um, okay, mm -hmm. let's go to, let's, yeah. since we're kind May of I just add out. to what you two were highlighting that Prosociality is occurring in what you just described, and uh, it just was a little aha shift that often we think of prosociality as being disseminated toward the person in lesser circumstance. But the prosociality you just role modeled toward the judge offered the way out of the loop that just kept getting worse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Just hold it up like this. Sure. I'm just using go, going to use my common sense here, so I'm not a lawyer. But you don't have to be. Okay, most cool. people in this room probably aren't lawyers. Let's You're hope. beautiful. So the perspective I have for the compassionate, first I have to really tune my mind to the compassionate thinking, which primarily means that I have to take out my hat of being judge or maybe inside before I come to the courtroom and understand the problems this person has gone through. And maybe when I'm sitting in a formal setting, 
I actually asked very important or relevant questions, which has actually led to that action or consequences. So I think it's a compassionate thinking by asking compassionate questions. Uh, and a judge might have to remove this, you know, whatever the judge's hat, whatever they call, uh, for a second and think as a human that why and why frequently is this occurring. It takes a little effort to go to the case just before coming to a consequence that you have to go through this because you have done three times of that. So that's what I feel like. You're just taking a step back, think about it, and just be a normal, not just like a body language, just like talking to a normal person. And then maybe taking that severe action if needed, or maybe a course of you know, uh, something which could, could avoid for the next time. This, could, this will not prevent. So some kind of preventative measure. Right. Thank Sorry you. for a long answer, but no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Let's see. Let's let's do one more. Okay. Um, oh, that was it. Oops. Uh, no, I'm too, too fast on the draw. Okay. Who says I have to do this? This is again. This is like a Ron Tyler thing. You're a public defender, but you're also a person of color, and you've been appointed to represent a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. What? A notoriously violent white prison gang considered to be responsible for the deaths of African Americans, Latinx, and white inmates. Your new client is facing a possible 25 year prison sentence on top of the life sentence he's already doing. Your colleagues and the prosecutors all think this is ironic. What a great joke that you've been appointed to represent him. So, how do how does the public defender, how do I, as a public defender, bring compassion to that situation? I mean, that's a tall order, right? Can I just say no? <laughs> what about that? So here comes a microphone. So I don't know any I don't know anything about the law, but I feel like maybe as a public defender, your job is actually to make sure that the person has a fair trial. Your job is not to convict or you know exonerate the person. So that's why you have to look at all of the angles and make sure the person gets a fair trial. That's very true. That's very true. But he hates me. He hates me. <laughs> I'm still at sea. Somebody else, help me out. How do I bring compassion to the situation? Sorry, Karen. I'll, uh, it's all, all the way over in the corner. No, it's OK. We'll give you the mic anyway. Um, if I, if I, I know I look white, but I'm a minority. <laughs> I, when I encounter racist people that I have to work with, and they don't realize I'm not Caucasian Caucasian, I like to take it as an opportunity to show them, hey, that these people that you hate, we can actually be nice and we can help you and like look at how much I can add to you if you're just willing to let me. So I try to just take the very helpful approach of no matter what you think of me, I'm gonna show you that I don't fit the stereotype of what you're thinking. And I think here it's, uh, I can't pronounce it well, all tourism. So tourism. Mm -hmm. if I chose to be a public defendant, I had to really, really look at myself and say, this is not a moment to be subjective. It's just a learning potential for that other person. Like, I can teach them that their views are not necessarily correct. Yeah. And that way I would stay calm. So that is, that is what, where I reached, actually, was this is really about an opportunity for me to model compassion and love. And that, that's where I came to. And I felt so good about that. Um, but let me show you the other scenario. Will he fight for me? This is the other, the other side. This is my client. You're a man who learned to survive in prison. You're not a loner. Loners don't make it in prison. Every inmate knows you have to join your group. There are white cell blocks, there are black cell blocks, there are Mexican cell blocks. You stick with your own or you get stuck. That's the way it works. It's not how I was raised. It's not how I lived outside, but it's how I have to live on the inside. 
And now I've got big problems because I'm facing this whole big case. The feds are trying to snuff out any chance I have at parole. I like this guy who's been appointed to represent me. He seems smart. He's probably going to Stanford later. He seems like a real fighter, actually. <laughs> but he's black. So how did he bring compassion to the criminal justice system? This man who I had to represent, who had his own set of notions about who I was. What do you think? You think about the traits that he may have used, because he had a lot of time to actually um, develop these traits of peace, I must say. And there were states of peace that he used to sustain that. So I think he would be pro-sociality, and in that case, acknowledging the fact that, you know, yes, I, I, I realize that, that you are you are black and you may you know not even like me for all the crimes that I have done and even and despite that you know these are my reasons or these are the situations that I'm in and kind of creating that again common humanity and like I am also suffering and I can also see all the reasons that you may not be willing to to help me and acknowledging the suffering of the other side might be something that connects them so I just have to like short circuit this to say that's exactly right. And it was one of the most profound lessons of the 22 years that I was a federal public defender. I mean, I'm just being real with you. Because where I was was the, I'm going to be the saint. Don't worry, I'm going to show you, sir, what it really means to represent someone. And where he was was, let me help you see, because I feel like you're actually, you're not seeing me, Ron Tyler. I'm not who you think I am. I was born and raised in the Bronx, OK? I am not who you think I am. The people that I ran the streets with look just like you do. I'm not who you think I am, you know? Now, does that mean that he was not part of the Aryan Brotherhood? I didn't say it means that. But it does mean that there was something much deeper than who, about who he truly was. He said, I'm surprised. I thought you knew the prisons are segregated by race. Don't you know that? Well, yes, I did know that. I said, well, then why don't you hold on to that? It's, how am I supposed to survive? You really think I can just be out there like a lone wolf? Do you know how long people survive who are lone wolves? I mean, it, he schooled me, but he schooled me in a really gentle and loving way. It was remarkable. It was remarkable. Um, and it was because, yes, I believe that he had, over the years he was in prison, been able to actually, truly support those traits of peace, actually. And he was able to say, I, I see you. Do you see me? I see our commonality. He was able to say to me, I taught myself Spanish here in prison. Is that what somebody does who actually hates people who are not of their race? No. So it was really profound. And we're going to have to wrap up as much as I would like to continue. The other comment I wanted to make is, you know, I've been in, in situations where the other party, it's really hard to have compassion for, uh, or even connectedness. And, and that part, you can kind of switch it to, to self-compassion and realizing, yes, I am angry. Yes, it is hard for me to like the other person. But that doesn't mean that I can still do the right thing. I still can stick to my ethics. I can still... You know, altruism is important for me and compassion is important for me. So even though I may not like the person, but there are certain values that I can stick to and still do the right thing, even though I don't feel that way. And this goes back to what you were saying, right? Exactly. So that's about the, we talked about the state of, the, the trait of, of uh, expressing your, your uh, moral principles, right? Um, so... I'm sorry to say that it's a few minutes after the hour, and so we're going to have to, uh, to, to close. But um, what I wanted to close with um, is, um, uh, first of all, my profound gratitude, uh, my honest gratitude for you to, at the end of a day where there were so many other things that had to have been going on for you, to choose to come here together to support each other, to choose to support me in our shared desire to actually live better lives, to live connected lives, 
to speak openly about loving each other. Um, and I told you that I like that, that one of my favorite contemplative practices is loving kindness meditation. Some of you may know of it, also known as meta meditation. And it's profoundly powerful because it, I would describe it as inviting us to recognize that no one is outside the circle. No one, actually. Right? Think about that tomorrow when the election results are coming in. No one is actually outside the circle. And so when I say to you, may you be well. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. And may you be loved. Our goal is to feel that not just for ourselves, not just for those we love, not just for those that we might come into contact with on a day-to-day -day basis, but for those who we're defining as our enemies. Can we actually remove that label and recognize their suffering and hope for love for them as well? Thank you all. <laughs> Tia asked me to mention that also, um, among other things, since I'm a professor here, one of the things I had to do was write. So I, <laughs> I have published an article about the work that we did together my colleague Suzanne Luban and I in the clinic um, and in particular about my work in self-care and it's called the first thing we do let's heal all the law students um, and so should you ever have the opportunity you might enjoy reading it so there you go thank you